In particular, it's about the continuous prototyping mindset, which is something that we developed while we were working on Jamestown, our first game. And the idea of continuously building prototypes as you go, as opposed to uh, just doing that up front. So, first of all, let's talk about prototyping uh, as a word. So, uh, if you've ever seen like a you know, police procedural or, uh, I don't know, one of those stories where somebody's going into, uh, it's like a private investigator going into uh, some kind of a suspect's house, and it's kind of like a benign, normal looking house, but he comes to like this one room, and it's like, looks kind of creepy, he opens it, and then you like see this inside, and it's all these like scrawls on the wall. Um, that actually, I was surprised to find, actually has a name. It's called uh, The Room Full of Crazy. Uh, that is, uh, this is actually taken from a web page, uh, which is called TV Tropes, which I hope all of you know about. Uh, it's a collection of all of these different, um, all these different uh, new words that have come about as a series of observations about trends that show up in television. And in fact, video games as well. This is, you know, the uh, Portal uses this. Uh, Dear Esther has the same idea in it. And when these trends show up over and over, people give them uh, names. Uh, they come up with words and phrases like the room full of crazy to describe them. Uh, there's a problem in game development though, which is that uh, when we design games, we don't have a shared design language. Um, we don't have some sort of a, a lexicon of words that we use to uh, describe these common trends and things that show up uh, in everyone's work or maybe in a specific type of game. Uh, we don't have that, 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 uh, that set of words. Uh, it makes it really hard to talk about design when we're uh, when we're all in a meeting trying to describe our ideas, or we're talking to other developers, or maybe just talking to a publisher trying to get a deal. It's hard to talk about those ideas because we just don't have the words. Um, in fact, uh, uh, we come up with those words internally as a as like a company. We'll, you know, we had words when we were working on Jamestown, like uh, there was uh, I don't know. The valley, and we had uh, just a bunch of weird things that, like, almost like uh, in jokes that only we would know. Uh, and it was, it was super helpful for us talking about games internally, but it, it weren't particularly handy if we ever wanted to talk to anyone else. If we wanted to, we'd have to have a big thing where we stood there and we, you know, let me tell you about an idea we came up with and spent about 15 minutes, then we could use the word. Uh, it's because we don't share those ideas in that way. It's actually uh, kind of a scary idea. If you think about 1984, uh, there's an idea they called Newspeak, which is a language that the government imposes on their people. And the idea of it is they remove like, words from it, like uh, you know, revolution. And, uh, and by doing that, people can't conceive of, they can't express these ideas like a political takeover uh, or unhappiness or uh, discontentment. And in doing so, it, it reveals, and I think uh, linguists have supported this uh, largely, that Words control our ideas, words define what we're able to express and also what we're able to think. So uh, I, I take words very seriously. Uh, talk about that. So specifically, prototyping is a really powerful and important word that uh, I've heard thrown around a lot. Uh, everyone's very excited about prototypes right now um, in games. But I think that when we talk about prototypes, people mean a lot of different things. So let's start with uh, uh, getting our definition straight collectively here. Um, so there's the engineer's de definition of what a prototype is, which is uh, one of the first units manufactured of a product which is tested so that the design can be changed if necessary before a product is manufactured commercially. That's from mechanical engineering. That's something uh, pretty old. That's where the term prototype really came from. But it doesn't really work for games. It's too focused on the idea of physical manufacture and uh, it's built around that whole world, that whole mindset of actually building something physical that needs to be manufactured, and it's very expensive to get a whole pipeline and factory set up. And there are elements of that in games, but it's not really perfect. Uh, Wikipedia has, a, I think, a better definition. It's a much broader uh, definition. An early sampler model built to test a concept or process or to act as a thing to be replicated or learned from. It bold to uh, test and learn because those are, the, I think, the big ideas about a prototype, the most important part of it um, is that you're testing and uh, you are experimenting and that you're learning and acquiring information about uh, what you are testing and experimenting with, which uh, 
I'll get into a little bit later. So if I were to like ask all of you what a prototype is, or you know, go to you know, uh, talk to just a bunch of game developers or whatever, I would get a lot of different answers as to what a prototype is. Here are a bunch of really common ones that have come up to me, uh, come up uh, in conversations with me in the past. So sometimes it's the first stage developing the game, like oh we're we're still prototyping it. Um, uh, sometimes it's a preliminary or early version. Uh, it's the way of saying, oh yeah, this is just, just a prototype. It's, it's, uh, it's just the very beginning of an idea. Actually, Cypher Prime uh, just on Friday showed off a one-day game that they had made, and it was very much that was the context. Um, hastily made, you know, the building's on fire. Uh, I have to make this really fast um, to keep our company afloat, maybe for a pitch, something like that. Uh, cheaply made, um, then we just, this was, it's almost sort of an excuse. This is, <laughs> it looks cheaply made because uh, it's a prototype. Uh, it's incomplete, same sort of thing. Like, oh, there's, a, there's no second level because it's a prototype, or it's a really good excuse if it's broken. Oh, I'm sorry, it crashed. It's a prototype. And uh, that, that's, that's often what people conceive of as a prototype of a game. But uh, those are really side effects of what a prototype is. They, they are things that are often true about prototypes, but they're not what we make them for. They're not why you would decide to go about making a, a prototype. Uh, so what we really want to talk about is motivations. Why would we go in in the first place and decide to create a prototype uh, for a game? So one of them is pioneering. Uh, if you have a new idea that no one's done, this is a really big thing in the indie world. I want to, I want to play this game that I've never seen. Uh, you might make a prototype to go out into that new frontier and see what you find. Uh, provisioning, uh, this is similar, but it has more to do with viability testing. This would be, you have this great idea, can we do it? Can a team of our size do it? How hard is it going to be? What kinds of problems are we going to run into if we decide to do this? Uh, so it's more sort of a, uh, a look before you leap type of thing. Uh, and then marketing, uh, that would be, you know, to gauge interest, to see how marketable something is. You know, you go to a bunch of people and say, hey, is this, is this idea, is this prototype seem like something you'd like uh, before, again, you decide to uh, commit to making it. So I came to sort of a useful definition based on all of that, um, that they all seem to be about, about uh, learning something uh, by showing it to someone which is that a prototype would be an interactive experiment that's used to gather information. Now, there are a lot of possible definitions as we saw for what a prototype is, but this is the one that I found most useful for games. If people use this definition when they're making games, it's extremely valuable, and it really gets to the heart of why you would make one. Uh, it is you, you're going to interactively experiment and acquire information for it. It's, it's fairly synonymous with experiment, but it has a, a real focus on the information gathering uh, from it. So uh, that is all to say, it's, uh, that's a good definition, but there's a lot more to it than just those words. I'll get into that now. So let's talk about conventional prototyping. This is how people approach prototyping. Uh, I would say in the last uh, 10 years, this has been the, what people meant if they were working with a publisher. Um, and that'll be a, oops, hello, there we go. Uh, that'll be a foundation for talking about this um, this idea of sort of continuous prototyping. So conventionally, uh, prototyping is a phase. It uh, is about two to 24 weeks at the outset, depending, that's just a, a basic range, a common range, and it's usually just some percentage of your total development cycle. 24 weeks would be for maybe a four-year game, a three-year game, uh, and then two weeks would be probably for you know a three-month game or something. Um, and it helps you understand what game you're going to make. Uh, if you go into uh, uh, a game as, as if it's a, um, a certainty, that can be pretty scary if you're going to say a, a five-year game. You're going to spend five years working on this. Most people have come to the understanding that spending a little time up front to make sure you actually want to commit to five years of making this game is important, especially when there's a lot of money on the line and you're, you're getting a publisher to agree to fund it. Uh, you really don't want to make a bad call. So people tend to create a prototype of the game. And this is considered a good practice and I don't disagree. Uh, there's an important uh, thing about the conventional prototyping though is that often people are talking about a prototype and a demo at the same time. As I mentioned, publishers uh, also are interested in prototypes before they commit to five years of funding. Um, that is 
an important qualification that we as an independent developer working on our game, Jamestown, didn't need to take into account. So a certain amount of it is selling the game, making something pretty, making something that other people want to pay for. Whereas, going back to the definition I had before, an experiment that gathers information is a very different thing. Uh, you can gather tons of information without demoing it to somebody else. That's more about communicating it. So I wanted to make a distinction there that uh, this talk is really a lot more about the prototyping part, the information gathering, and not so much about um, getting someone to think your game is great based on that prototype. So uh, real quick, uh, who here's played Jamestown? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, cool. So let me see if I can actually play this video. Okay, so this is, this is what the game looks like. It's a top-down uh, shooter, and it is uh, four-player cooperative. Right now it's just a one-player video. Um, it was released on Steam. It took us 21 months to make. It's our, our dream project. We were a three-man team uh, working on it, and we did some, some subcontracting out to uh, people for sound and uh, music, and did a lot of testing. Uh, Particularly though, we did a lot of prototypes in the process of, of making this game. So you'll see examples from this throughout, and uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you get a sense of it here, hopefully that'll give some context to the examples I've given. So uh, let's talk about developing uh, the game. As I mentioned, it's a 21 month development cycle, and we were three full-time developers. This was our full-time job uh, that when we were working on it, so this was not like a part-time gig. We were in the office every morning and worked quite a few hours. Uh, we decided early on we wanted to make a custom engine. Uh, this is a, a complex decision and I can talk about that uh, after the talk a little bit, but the big motivation for it was we wanted to create something that was as good for developing a game as something like, uh, as for prototyping a game I should say, as something like Flash. Uh, Flash was kind of our high watermark at the time, back in 2009, for quickly trying ideas out, this is something we believed in. So we wanted to have an engine where we could make our whole game like that and still deploy it to something other than web. Um, so that was a big focus for us as we started work. Uh, but we knew it would take five months to do, uh, having scoped it out, and it turned out actually to take about five months. Uh, so at that time we said, why don't we, since we think Flash is good, uh, and we know it, and we have it, why don't we make a conventional prototype? That is, we'll spend those same five months prototyping the game, making a representative game that we can use to learn all this stuff about how uh, shooters work. We wanted to make a top-down shooter. So we did a lot of experiments. Um, here's the prototype that we actually made. Um, this was done in Flash uh, over the course of about five months. This is one of, I don't know, 10 completely different <laughs> prototypes that we did, but this is the one that I think best represents what we ended up making. Uh, this is the most Jamestown-like. Um, it has a few mechanics that you won't see in Jamestown that uh, I'll, I'll actually talk about later. They're, they're pretty relevant to this talk. Um, but they, uh, you can see it's, it's a shooter, it's top-down, it's scrolling much like Jamestown was. Uh, so one of the goals of this prototype was uh, we wanted to fill in those gaps of knowledge that we, ha that we had. I mean, you play a game, and anyone who's, who's made a game knows uh, it's all about illusion. That's, why we, that's what, what we do when we make games. We can't actually create the reality that you're seeing here. Uh, this is all illusion work, and all the games that we love, that we in some way want to recreate parts of, like the ones that we grew up playing, uh, those games cheated, especially the older ones, in some really complex, sophisticated, and counterintuitive ways, and they cheated so well that you are drawn into the illusion, you believe they did what they did in an entirely different way than they actually did. So what we wanted to know is how much of what we think they're doing is real, and how much is complex illusion work, and to figure out solutions to those very difficult problems that they, uh, that they solved, uh, that we wouldn't otherwise know the solutions to. So that actually was a huge amount of work. Um, they, we sort of call these magic tricks. Uh, the camera, the way that the camera moves, uh, the pacing of enemies, uh, and the what weapons are fun and which ones aren't, were all really difficult uh, to resolve. Particularly the camera, um, we discovered they do some really tricky stuff in uh, games, especially with two players, uh, to make it so that neither player pulls the other player off the screen or moves the other player 
uh, and that it's intuitive, even if the camera is moving around, showing different parts of the screen, things that the fact that enemies don't fire from off screen, uh, in terms of enemies, actually, I didn't even list that down. Enemies don't fire from the bottom quarter of the screen in almost any shooter game. They also don't fire from within about a half inch radius if you're close to them. There's this weird stuff that everyone did, and when you actually make the game, you realize that that's really important, and that if they hadn't done those small, subtle things that no one ever notices, the game is like a fifth as much fun. So that was really important that we did that up front. Some of that changed the algorithms that we created. They changed how we did, thought about making levels, the pacing in particular. You know, most of uh, the games that we love do a new idea every 15 seconds. And that changes how you think about how much content you're gonna have to make and how hard it's gonna be to build levels. Um, so this turned out to be extremely fruitful. Uh, and the actual code we knew would be disposable because it was written in ActionScript and our game was gonna be written in C++ and Lua. So it wasn't, uh, often people say, oh, a prototype, you throw away all the code at the end, like it's some sort of an important ritual. Um, we did it because we had to. There was just no way around it. Uh, we were not going to use ActionScript in our game. Uh, so it was a good case study for what if you threw away every single piece of prototype code, would it have been worth it at the end? Um, so let's talk about the outcomes, and I'll get to the, uh, the thing I was mentioning. Um, so the biggest thing, actually, that this did for us, other than deconstructing the magic tricks, was unifying our vision and concept. We operate by consensus, which means that every decision we make as a company, uh, between the three of us, is done with complete agreement. Everyone has to agree. It's not a vote. We don't do like a two-thirds thing. It's every single decision needs to be agreed on by everybody. And that's hard, and that was a really crazy, ambitious thing, but Hal is Quaker, uh, and I uh, am also very into uh, Quakerism, and they operate by consensus, so we thought, well, there's a large organization that does that. Let's try this and see how it goes. Uh, what was great about the prototype was that it unified our whole vision. When you make the thing, you collapse all these possible realities about what the game is. You know, Mike had his vision for what the game was. I had my vision, and Hal had his. And parts of those, that vision were unified, and we agreed about what would be great. And we had this game in our minds, in fact, we had three games in our three minds. Um, by making something, we collapsed that into one game. We could, vote, we could all play in front of us that was real, and we could look at it. And suddenly, all those different, all three of those different visions of what the game could be started to converge on this one thing. And that gave us a great sort of milestone, sort of uh, landmark for everything that was going to follow. Uh, and we actually refer to this as a touchstone. Uh, and I'll talk some more about that later, but the idea of a touchstone is it is something that you can actually see and touch and interact with. Uh, it changes how you think about your ideas and your creative vision. And it can be very good for facilitating new ideas, but it's also great for uh, unifying lots of different visions. Uh, Another interesting outcome, it took two weeks to port the entirety of what we did uh, over to uh, our new engine. We had actually, I think within, was it four weeks, we had the art integrated and everything. Like the game was fully playable. Uh, we had an entire level ready uh, in one month. And we were really shocked at that. We expected it would take much longer. Uh, but the actual code that we'd written, once you solve those hard problems and you have action script in front of you, it's really easy to rewrite it. Um, code that is gameplay code tends to be a lot simpler to port over. Uh, game, it's not like a, you know, a multi-threaded uh, serialization system that's trying to stream things in off the internet. That, that would be hard to port, but something where it's like, you know, how often the enemies come in, uh, how fast the player moves, the camera algorithm, these are pretty straightforward pieces of code. So we were actually really delighted at how smooth that transition went. I, I barely remember it. It just was just a couple weeks of enjoyable work seeing the game come to life in our new engine. And we threw all the old code away, didn't really care. Um, a lot of the algorithms and designs survived, so that was the value. And this, uh, this is a, a big point of this talk is that was the value. Acquiring that information about what the algorithms and designs would be was what uh, validated having done the prototype, the actual code, um, not as much. It was really the thoughts and ideas and information that we uh, extracted. Uh, and we didn't need a demo to a publisher. I don't want to harp on it too much, but that was really important. That demo you saw probably wouldn't have gotten us a deal. Um, 
but the game was great in the end. So um, if you do have a publisher, it's important to uh, remember that the demoing part of that is probably the bulk of your time, is my suspicion. Making something that you can sell is a huge amount of work and a very different type of process. So um, if, you, if you also need to demo when you're doing a conventional prototype, don't expect that um, you can do what we did and somehow that will just be fine. Um, so again, what's the problem with the conventional prototype? They're great, that was super valuable. Clearly our game benefited greatly from doing it. Problem is that problems kept appearing, new problems after that prototype. So we have it in engine now, we ported everything over and we had a whole level in there and that was not the end of the problems. The very problems that uh, motivated us making that initial conventional prototype. There's exactly that class of problem that continued to present itself over and over again throughout your whole development cycle. Took too many assumptions. Um, we assumed that that first level was going to represent the following four. So we'd say, oh well, we've got that level, so what about our next level? What will it be like? Well, it'll be different in this way, and it'll have these types of enemies. And those enemies uh, will probably be really fun in this way, so we'll make an enemy that'll complement that enemy, and then we'll make like a boss, and the boss will use those mechanics that we learned in the level, and it'll be about this long, and anyway, all these assumptions. And like, the first assumption that that uh, first enemy will be fun is like just as risky as the stuff that we were testing out before. We were to go through uh, making all five of the levels that were in the final game just on paper at that point. The, the chance that we would have made a mistake early on in that process and had a cascading error that uh, rippled through the whole game is extremely high. Um, and so my thesis of being here, uh, that when your, your prototyping phase up front ends, you really can't stop prototyping. That's not when prototyping ends. That's just when the phase ends. So here's a quick graph. Um, so a design question is, um, is it's sort of a, a thing you don't know about your design, like, uh, for instance, how will the camera move? Or how fast should the player move? Things like this. The number of design questions you have is charted on one axis uh, from less to more, uh, and then the entire development cycle, that, that is a timeline. So there's questions over time. And what you see here is sort of the ideal curve in blue. That's what we imagine this curve to look like. Uh, we start with tons of design questions, and over time, that number of questions goes down until it reaches a really low number. I mean, there's a few left, but it's pretty minimal. And then the prototyping phase is over, and we quash the last of those design questions as we finish off the game. Uh, that's a wonderful idea, but it is uh, fantasy. That's not actually how the world works. Um, quite the contrary, um, this is really what it looks like, at least as far as we found it. You get down not as many questions as you'd like before the end of the prototyping phase. It's still a pretty unknown space. Uh, and as soon as you start on a new feature, uh, particularly a big feature like, I don't know, a simple example, the core mechanic for your second level of Jamestown, you suddenly spike up a whole lot more questions you didn't even know were there that you need answers to. And then you work like crazy to knock them down, and then you get to the next level or mechanic, or you do a play test that reveals something really subtle that happens in a configuration of players that you didn't actually test before. And it's a big deal because some fundamental assumption that you'd made turns out to be false, and you have a lot more questions to answer. And it presents a really difficult situation, which is um, how do you go about resolving these other spikes of questions? Do you do another prototyping phase? Do you just kind of plow through and hope that they'll go away? I think the latter is what a lot of studios do, uh, who have, um, I think, taken a very traditional approach. They build a big design document that outlines what the game will be. They get it funded. They uh, commit to it with a schedule when things will be done. And it's really hard to change those rigid commitments. And so they kind of just plow through, and I think that's where a lot of the um, big disappointments in games come from uh, for developers and players alike, is where people have committed prior to really um, experimenting and learning about the things that they're committing to. So in our case, as I mentioned, level-specific content, every level has different challenges, and 
it really boils down to, are you guys familiar with the vertical slice? A vertical slice being you cut through your game and you create a sort of a, maybe an example being a single level where it's completely done. Everything about it is like what your final game will look like. It's a full experience. Um, called a vertical slice, but it's not a horizontal slice. If you try to take that vertical slice and sort of stretch it horizontally across all of your uh, levels, in our case, uh, it doesn't really scale cleanly. There's tons of new questions in, in that process. The vertical slices are really great for, for rooting out questions, but it will not be all of them, and it will not be all the important ones. Uh, a great, simple, intuitive example being the final level of a game. The final level of a game is very different, usually, from the first level. They're usually really, really different. You're, 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 syn you're, you're synthesizing what you've learned. It's usually brutally difficult. It needs to have a sense of closure and drama and excitement. It needs to be satisfying. It's your last experience. And the first level is usually teaching people stuff. And that's just a very different process. That vertical slice, which one do you do? Do you do the last level first or do you do the first level first? Whichever you do, there's a ton of different types of challenges that's going to show up in either one. It just doesn't scale. Um, as I mentioned, one idea per 15 seconds. Uh, that's a lot of ideas that we have to have. If you think about that, uh, five levels, each level is around maybe five minutes. Uh, so that's 25 minutes of gameplay uh, times four. That's a lot of ideas. That's 100 ideas, probably. And by ideas, I mean really you know, new enemies, new configurations of enemies surprises, things that are engaging and make the player say, oh, I haven't seen that before. With two levels done, that's really, that's just not, uh, that's not all of them. There's, you just, numerically, all those ideas are going to have to get dealt with. Uh, so, that's all to say, level-specific design is just as volatile, and that's not the, the full extent of it. There's tons of things like that in designing a game. So, uh, unknown unknowns, uh, if you've ever heard uh, Donald Rumsfeld had this fantastic quote once, uh, that everyone makes fun of, and I, it's pretty ridiculous. But I do think it's, it's actually pretty insightful in its way. He was saying that, uh, i see if I can remember it, uh, in this world there are, um, there are, thing, there are known uh, things, things we know, and there are uh, known unknowns, the things that we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns, which are the things we don't know that we don't know. Uh, which is just very confusing. It's a great soundbite if you can find it. Uh, but it, it's true. They're the, they're the scariest thing about designing a game. They're the scariest thing about committing to anything is you don't know what you don't know. You get in there and you, you maybe you've already committed to something and you realize, I, don't, I didn't even realize this was going to be a problem. I had listed all the problems that were going to be really challenging, planned how long they were going to take. I doubled my estimates for how long they were going to take. But all the other stuff that I didn't know I was supposed to put in that list could take up half of my time. And I think that at the end of the day, that's why we double our estimates, is it's, it's a secret way of accounting for all the things that aren't listed. Um, but you can't prototype up front if you want that kind of determinism. Um, in fact, when you, when you innovate, that's what innovation is, right? It's doing something you haven't ever seen before. The nature of that is you're gonna face new questions. And what I often find is, if it hasn't been done before, chances are it has been done, and never shipped because the questions that it presented had really unfortunate, tragic answers like, this will take two years more to do. Um, so I have grown over the course of making our, our game Jamestown to really respect and expect uh, unknown unknowns. Just assume they're there, they're always there. If you just look back on your life, I'm sure you'll find that. Whenever you commit to a big project, doing something you haven't done before, which is basically any innovative game, uh, you are going to see there are countless things you didn't even realize were there. Uh, so my belief is any major feature that you do in a game, you should prototype it before you commit to doing it. Uh, this requires, and this is part of the sort of continuous uh, prototyping mindset, is that requires rethinking how you make games if what you're used to is a big design document up front where you commit at the outset to what you're going to do later. Which brings us to continuous prototyping. So here's an idea that we had when we were originally making Jamestown. You can see it in the, um, uh, the uh, prototype that I showed. We got in a big room and we did a big brainstorming session and we came up with this idea. So you can see on the right here, there's uh, four ships 
the bomber, shield, beam, and charge. Uh, three of those are in the final game. Uh, we had this idea that you could switch between those different weapons. Uh, the beam was going to shoot like a big beam forward, the charge ball would shoot a big ball that would have a piercing attack, the bomber would be like a melee area of effect, and then the shield would actually have a shield that they could use to eat bullets. And you would be able to switch between these by sort of like Metroid Prime uh, or a first person shooter, uh, pressing a button would switch you from sort of stance to stance, like in um, a fighting game. They had like crane stance or defensive stance and offensive stance, focus stance, whatever. This sounded really fun. We'd seen it done, right? Um, it's full of interesting choices. Uh, imagine a game where now you're thinking in every stage of the level. It's a whole new, um, it's a whole new uh, decision. What's the right weapon to use here, as opposed to what's the right, what's the weapon I want to play for this whole level? Um, so we said, let's let them switch mid game. We'd seen the dumb four, as I mentioned, fighting games do this all the time. Uh, Soul Calibur, I think three, there's like a stance for practically every character in it, and they're all different, and it's super fun. Uh, Ikaruga and Radiant Silver Gun, uh, two games by Treasure, have this uh, idea of switching weapons, or at least switching modes. Ikaruga, you switch from uh, a white ship to a black ship, and that changes what bullets are power-ups and which ones will kill you. Uh, and that idea of like switching on the fly, uh, it sounded great. Uh, but a uh, notable sort of foreshadowing, Ikaruga and Radiant Silver Gun are both notoriously mind-crushing, mind-bending games. So uh, we'll go into how it went. So it felt like a safe bet to us. We'd seen it done. We knew it was something that we'd enjoyed in games. And we, we really dug deep on this. We were like, you know, this is going to be great. So we worked out what all the stances would be. We worked out like what kinds of bosses would be fun. All in our, our fictional, imaginary, stance-switching mechanic. In fact, is what Jamestown was going to be. This was the whole plan. Um, but when we put the prototype out there in front of people, we re it revealed some pretty major misconceptions. Um, notably, we discovered that um, when you're actually playing with the stance mechanic, it's really difficult to keep your brain on what stance you want, like what you're going to do when what you're really going to be doing is saying, oh my god, bullets, oh my god, oh my god, and you're like looking at like a half an inch in front of your ship, and you're praying you don't get hit by bullets. And that's most of, at least a beginner's experience, and even an advanced player. The harder it gets, the more you're going to be thinking about not dying. You're not thinking about what you're throwing out, you're basically just holding on the fire button and hoping that something in front of you gets hit by the bullets while you dodge. Um, and that's really, I mean, anyone who's played one of these games, that is true. That's how it feels. That's a lot of the fun of it, actually. Um, so when it comes to the stance changing, what we found is players would change stance at the very beginning when there were no enemies on screen, and then they just play. And they might, at some point, if you reminded them, like, hey, you want to try, like, switching stances? They'd do it for maybe a couple seconds. And then they wouldn't change again because it just was too much. Uh, and realistically, if you do a good job with the stances, they're all fun. They're all enjoyable. They don't need to switch. Uh, and if they did need to switch, they probably would stop having fun. Uh, and we tried things like, well, let's make it like there's, a, there's gaps in the level where you have a chance to, to change stances or you can like, pause. And ultimately, that just that broke the flow and the engagement that makes shooters fun. Uh, if they don't want to change stances, they're just waiting for the next part to start or they're being interrupted from what was a pretty engaging, exciting, roller coaster of an experience. So uh, there might have been ways to fix it that we never actually found. I won't say that there weren't. It, it taught us that fun is not guaranteed until you feel it. It just isn't. It's, it's too complex. Which brings me to the idea of an unknowable system. So here are three pretty complex uh, examples of systems. Uh, human psychology, uh, global economics, and weather systems. We don't really have a full understanding of any of these. This isn't, these, none of these have like a perfect model where we can say whether the stocks are going to go up tomorrow uh, or whether it's going to be raining in a year. We just don't, we can't do that. In fact, even a week is sometimes tricky. But we have models. We have a system by which we begin to understand it, sort of these approximate models. And when we're wrong, we attempt to fix them. We experiment and we say, oh, that wasn't right. And then we go back into the model and we revise it. Uh, and we get closer and closer to where we are. I mean, at this point, we can probably say whether the stock's going to go down sometimes. We can read certain 
features. Uh, we can say whether it's going to rain based on satellite data. We can, we can sometimes be right, and we're better than we've ever been, but we can never know it for, for full uh, certainty. Game design and fun are exactly as complex, I, I say, as human psychology, um, because they tie into human psychology. Fun is part of human psychology. It, you can't deterministically say whether or not people will find something fun. You have an intuitive model in your head for what's fun, based on what you've seen, what you've done. It's intuitive, but it's probably pretty accurate. You can foresee certain mistakes, but you can't know for sure. Human brain is too complex, uh, and it's over time, and everyone's a little bit different. So we need to approach the idea of game design and making things fun and, and, and anticipating fun as something that is unknowable in, in the absolute sense. So how do people approach this in the rest of the world? It is the scientific method. Let me, uh, let me break down the scientific method for you here. So first thing you do, I'll, I'll give examples for how this works in games, uh, perhaps in Jamestown. I'll use that example from before. Um, so you ask a question. This might be, uh, is the idea that we have for stance switching in our shooter going to be fun? Then you do some background research. Mm, well, we played some fighting games and Nicaragua and Radiant Silver Gun. And it looks pretty fun there. I think what we want to do will be fun. Then you construct a hypothesis. Hypothesis. This is going to be fun. Then you test it with an experiment. You make a prototype, as in our case. You put it in front of people and you see what they do. So then you uh, analyze your results, which are, they didn't think it was very fun. Then you draw your conclusions. Probably wasn't very fun. <laughs> then you think, why wasn't it fun? Oh, I bet that it was because the HUD didn't represent the data well enough. They didn't know what stance they were in. They didn't realize they could switch, or they didn't know why they would switch to one or the other. We'll, we'll give them better feedback. Uh, and then you try again. You construct a hypothesis. With better feedback, this will be fun. Then you test it with an experiment again. They're like, it's really not very fun. You analyze the results and so forth. This is the iterative design process. Uh, and it's the heart of what the scientific method is. And it's the heart of how I think people should go about designing games. And I think most people intuitively feel that, yeah, that's, that's how a game should be made. No one designs a chess by writing out what all the pieces are going to do and how big the board will be and then say, okay, here. It's chess. You, you do this. This is how you make something fun. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the idea that information is valuable. We all sort of know that you know, information is power and all of that. But more specifically, if you are making a game and you have some agency into the design, which if you're making a game, you do, even if you're not the designer. If you're a programmer or an artist, you're going to make decisions every second of what you do. Uh, about, let's say you're an artist. How big is the thing? Uh, how fast does it move on screen? Well, how it looks is going to put some bounds on how fast it can move. Uh, it won't look it, obvious for, you know, you can't have a giant that's running around like a, like a jackrabbit on the screen. Artists are making a lot of decisions about what actually is going to happen in the game. Programmers, similarly, if you are programming uh, the actual enemy, let's say, in the shooter game, you're making a ton of decisions about exactly how fast do those bullets move. And, what is the state machine? What's, what, what can you add to it later? What can you uh, improve about the enemy later? What's rigid? What's locked in? Uh, so those decisions are really important. And they rely on having good information. If you have bad information, uh, you're going to make bad decisions. Uh, also, information is, is like the currency of design discussions. When you're talking with someone and you um, are trying to come, in, as in our case, to a uh, consensus decision where everyone agrees. That information is, is critical. Two, pe two people are trying to decide whether or not something is going to be fun in the future. Like, say, the stance mechanic. Let's say that me and Mike disagreed about what was going, whether the stance mechanic would be fun. I can wave my hands and say, yeah, I, this is, this is going to be great. I can, I can feel it. He said, no, I can feel it's not going to be fun. And then we'll just go back and forth forever and never get it. I might say then, well, actually, I did some research, and I played Radiant Silver Gun and Ikaraga, and I think what we're doing is pretty similar to that in these critical ways, and I think it's fun for this reason. And now you've got a little more information from having played these games that you can bring to that discussion. And uh, the more specific that information is, the more valuable it's going to be. 
Like, for instance, if I said, actually, I implemented the feature in Flash. Let's play it. Then that's really good information. Or I implemented it in Flash and I tested it with 100 people. The better that information gets, the easier it's going to be to make a decision. Uh, that's, I think, the big point here is the better, more specific your information is, the more of it you've got, the more fluid your design discussions will go. And that's a big part of making games is getting buy-in and coming to these decisions uh, as well as possible, getting the best answers. Uh, so the question that comes up is how much information is enough? When do you need more? When do you just commit to a solution? You know, I can test with 100 people. I can test with 1,000 people. Uh, I can release it to the public and give people, you know, a dollar for playing it, whatever. When do I have enough information about something? So there's an idea from a Netflix talk, a Netflix presentation that you can download. And if you do have, if you are taking notes by any chance, you should totally write that URL down, you know, on paper, um, and pull it up later. It is an amazing talk, and it talks particularly about the idea of recoverability and errors, recoverable mistakes. Um, the concept is, if you are making a decision, there's a chance that you, will, you won't be able to come back if you make the wrong call. Uh, this could be, uh, let's say you're Netflix and you make a decision to hire somebody uh, to be your CEO. And he tanks your company and your company dies. That would be unrecoverable. You would, be, you would no longer exist uh, as a company. However, the reality is that probably hiring the wrong CEO is recoverable because you could fire him and hire someone else. Uh, if you hire a programmer in Netflix, let's say, that's a much more recoverable probably than your CEO. If you hire an intern and he's crappy getting coffee, that's completely recoverable. It doesn't matter. Um, essentially, recoverability is how much does it matter if you're wrong? It's the stakes of a decision. Is it all in? If you're wrong about this, do you get a second chance? That's basically my metric for when I have enough information. I don't need a lot of information for a decision that is recoverable, extremely re recoverable. I can fix it later. If it's wrong, oh, it was wrong, and I'll fix it. But if it's something like coming up with a premise for our game that we're going to try to sell, that will determine whether or not we get to make a second one. That, that is a really important decision. If we make the wrong game and at some fundamental level it's not, it's not going to like, resonate with anyone, that requires and necessitates getting a lot of information up front. In the case of like, uh, the game premise, put it in front of a lot of people and ask them questions. Try a lot of ideas. Uh, spend a good, I don't know, if you're going to spend two years on a game, spend a good two weeks, three weeks just coming up with what the game's going to be. Um, it's important. So the more information you have, the less risk you have, and I tend to say the less risk that you uh, have on round recoverable uh, decisions is uh, the better. So there's an idea, actually, this, I love this story, uh, so I, I give it, basically every talk I give. Um, so I got to watch Sin City with Frank Miller, who is the author of Sin City. This was Sin City, this was like a big deal for me. Um, and uh, afterward, everyone went to get punch and pie at a local comic shop and uh, got to ask questions. So I don't know, uh, who here has seen Sin City? Okay, uh, so Sin City was actually a comic book, one of the most famous comic books uh, ever made. Uh, Frank Miller is one of the most famous comic writers and artists uh, who's ever lived. And Robert Rodriguez is the maker of El Mariachi, Desperado, Spy Kids, famous director. And notably, notoriously, uh, the two of them co-directed the movie. Robert Rodriguez actually had to leave the Directors Guild uh, to do that. It was illegal by the rules to have two directors who were actually both called the director. Um, but they did it. And it's a kind of an interesting moment in time. You take one of the most visionary, powerful uh, writer and artist from the comic world and his work, and you adapt it to film by one of the most visionary and powerful directors in the world. And I had an obvious question for him which is, uh, given that design decisions and disagreements often plague uh, visionaries, how did they dis decide what to do when they disagreed? Who took precedence? Who got to make the call? I had no idea. So I asked him, and he said that what they did 
was when they disagreed about some shot or some scene or what, some change, um, rather than arguing forever based on their gut and their intuition, they would just shoot it both ways. They would, they would just literally shoot the shot twice. Uh, and then they'd wait two weeks until it had been uh, made ready to watch. Then they'd go out into the screening room, a room much like this, and they'd sit back and watch both of them. And at the end, they would always agree about what the better one was because they had more information. Uh, and they often wouldn't even remember who had wanted which one. It was just obvious what the right path was, and they would just take that path. And he said that always worked. Uh, I pressed him about it, and I'm like, there was no uh, decision that didn't work that way. And actually, we discovered that that's very similar to how our experience went. And when it was a high-stakes, non-recoverable decision, it was worth doing uh, every time. So prototyping is a way to shoot it both ways, remove that speculation, and make really good decisions when it matters. So talking a little bit about the philosophy of how I approach prototyping, which I find really valuable, uh, I prototype for information. A prototype for me is an information gathering apparatus. It's something I use to just harvest information. That's how I think about it. I think it's extremely important that you think about prototypes like that. Um, the means uh, don't matter. What matters is the information that you have in hand at the end of it. And that sounds obvious, but it, it's actually sort of a little subtle. Um, people talk often about failed prototypes, the idea like this prototype was a failure. Uh, and what they usually mean is it wasn't fun. It, 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 the thing I thought would be fun wasn't fun. And that's viewed as a failure. For instance, our stance changing mechanic in Jamestown. But that's really a misconception. That is not a failure. That is a huge success. If you decide to make that game that isn't fun without prototyping it, uh, you've made a really big mistake. You may kill your company. You may spend a year on a game you don't like, maybe longer. Uh, the information that it's not fun is what you're there to get. That is extremely valuable, and it's not a failure to find that something that you thought was going to be fun isn't fun. It's extremely important, extremely valuable, and you will uh, pat yourself on the back basically every day for having done it. So what I like to do is to gather as much information as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, that's what a prototype is for me. It's a machine that just harvests information as fast as possible. If it takes a really long time, it's a worse prototype for me. That's, for me, what makes a good or a bad prototype. Is did I get lots of information really fast? And was it good information? Uh, did it help me make good decisions? So here's an example for our game. Uh, player speed and damage. It's the kind of thing you take for granted when you're making a game, is how fast does the player move? There's an endless array of possibilities. I mean, when you see it in your mind, you've got a sense of it. What number do you actually put in for player speed um, and, and, and player damage? It turns out that in a four-player shooter, where it's cooperative and there's four ships moving on screen at once, um, there's a lot of uh, good player speeds. A lot of them work, and they're better for some things and they're worse for others. It depends on how you build your levels. It depends how many players you have. For one player, you want him to move pretty quickly so he can get around this whole big screen really fast. If you've got four players, you kind of want to isolate them a little bit and make them do sort of like uh, tennis doubles. You want like, guys, I'll take the left, you take the right. If you can move really fast, that gameplay doesn't emerge. You, you just, anyone can be anywhere. One guy can sort of play the whole game. Um, so there are a lot of different optimal values. Um, yeah, one player moves around more than four. So what we did was we actually created really quick keybinds, a plus and minus key were bound to this, um, where we tweaked the player speed I in real time. We'd have uh, between one and four players play, and we would just press the plus and minus keys to, uh, until it felt the most fun, until everyone was having the most fun. We played around with that just by letting people play, uh, and then writing down what the final value was at the end of it. And we got values for one, two, three, and four players, what the optimal numbers were. Uh, and then we looked at them, and uh, we saw that they were all different, but that they, there was kind of a middle ground that was within the ranges of the good and the bad for all of them. So we said, well, that's, that's probably worth trying. We just set that value and tried it out. We did a tiny bit, but basically we ended up with a really good player speed that worked for one to four players. That's an important opportunity to get an unknown unknown. Like, for instance, the player needs to move at different speeds and all the different uh, uh, numbers of players. It turned out we, did, we found a good central speed, and we were really happy for that, and that was good to know as soon as possible. Um, there was a really tight iteration loop. That is, 
plus and minus is an iteration, playing a level is an iteration extremely fast, and the setup time, the overhead that we put in to, to do that prototype was extremely low. It took two lines, one line to increase, one line to decrease. Uh, it was super fast. Um, so uh, one thing about that also, uh, that's actually a really important aspect of thinking about prototypes also, is uh, you want to have a really, um, a really low upfront cost and a really low iteration cost. I know it's, sometimes those are competing curves. The more you do up front, the faster you can iterate inside. What you're always looking for is that holy grail, like this one, where it's almost no time to make and almost no time to iterate. Uh, because I believe the more iterations you do, the better your, uh, your information will be and the better your decision is going to be. Another aspect of uh, approaching prototypes uh, and how you think about that is to think about it as questions that you're going to ask, that you need answers to. Um, like, will this be fun? That's an important question that I talked about earlier. How will players behave, though? That's another thing. How are players going to react in this space? What will they do? What will they do when I put in front of them my game? And then, what do they expect the game is going to be like? What do they expect their experience is going to be? What do they expect the game to do? Those are all very different questions, um, and they're all extremely useful when designing games in almost any scenario. I, I put those ones in because for almost any feature, those three questions are incredibly important. But there are tons of other questions, and the kind of prototype you do will be different for each of those. Uh, if you want to know what players expect, you might actually ask a bunch of questions before they play. That might be your prototype. If you want to know if it's fun, you're probably going to create the feature and put them in front of it. And seeing how they behave similarly, you're going to put them in front of it, you're going to pay attention to different things. Uh, you're going to watch their hands a lot more, as opposed to watching their face, maybe, if you want to know if it's fun. Um, so the right question leads to the right prototype. You want to think very concretely about exactly what it is you want to know, uh, and I think that will lead you to making a really good information gathering machine. Not all prototypes are about finding out if something's fun. Might be the big takeaway from that. Uh, so prototyping four players was another good case study from our game. We wanted to make a really, truly cooperative shooter. Uh, have anyone here actually played a, a shooter with more than one pe person playing, like a two player or something? Okay, it's, it's pretty rare, pretty uncommon. Um, but that feature is in almost all these shooters because they wanted to go in the arcade and make twice as much money uh, from the quarters. Um, those games aren't really cooperative usually. Sometimes they're even adversarial, but they're all simultaneous. They're two-player simultaneous play. A few of them are four-player simultaneous play, but they're not really cooperative. You're not helping each other. You're not interacting between players very much. It's kind of like you're both killing stuff, and then you're not dying because the stuff got killed. And that's cooperation, but it's, it's very much lightweight, and you don't really feel like you want your friend there sometimes. A lot of the time, you all you got like shared lives, like you've got four lives between you. So if your friend sucks, you really don't want them to be playing with you. And there's a lot of problems that just come up that I could tell when people made uh, the four-player mode or two-player mode in their shooters. They just basically put another player in and walked away and said, "This is good enough. We'll make more money." Uh, but they didn't really focus on making a cooperative experience. So what we really wanted to do, one of our big goals, was to have that imagined experience that we wanted as kids, where we'd play together and it would just be twice as fun because there were two of us. In fact, we wanted to do it four players so that we could have four times as much fun. Uh, and that was a really exciting thing for us. That was a big goal we had when making this game. Uh, but we didn't actually have the resources and time to do it. We were worried about it. We knew it would have a lot of unknown unknowns. It would be really risky. So we actually didn't make it at first. We said, we're not going to do this feature. It's too risky. Having basically no information on whether or not it would actually be hard, we just didn't, we just didn't do it. We weren't thinking yet about the idea of prototypes to gain information. But I was on the plane to GDC, and I was like, oh, man, I really want to do that four-player mode. And I'm on the plane. It's not really work hours. So I'm just going to do it. I can stamp out more players and hook them into more controllers, and we'll just do this. Uh, so I wrote party mode, as I called it at the time, which was a four-player mode, uh, in about four hours on the plane. Uh, and it was super naive. It just put four players in. It would crash at the end. This <laughs> didn't even like work. But you could get in and play a game, and we could see people playing. And I thought that'll be fun. I'll show it to my friends and see what happens. Uh, it's the best feature in the game. It turns out it was the best feature in the game even then. Even in its broken, naive, trivial implementation, it was totally the most fun 
we would play like our game with two players or one player that was, you know, what we hoped would be lots of fun. And then when they play four player mode, people would be laughing and they'd be like, let's do that again. After it crashed, we'd rerun it and they would still want to do it again. It was just way more fun and we realized there was something just fantastic about doing uh, a four player shooter game that actually tried to uh, uh, make that the focus. Uh, that facilitated that, made it easy to get four people in. Uh, so then we did a series of part of iterations on that prototype uh, that were super fast. We did them at GDC. First observation was it was too crowded. Uh, people, when players would say when they were playing it, oh, this is, this, it's just too small, I can't, you know, there's four of us in this tiny little space. Um, and they were saying it was really confusing to see what was going on, and I was like, well, what can I do? It's really quick to learn whether or not what they're saying is true, how hard it's going to be to fix, etc. I'm like, well, actually, when we instantiate a level, all I do is just put all the objects in the world. So I could just put all the objects in the world again, shift it over by about 320 pixels, double the width of the screen, and that would probably work, and it did. Uh, it was really weird. You had two copies of the level. They didn't, like, smoothly go, so we mirrored the art, and so it did this kind of weird, like, reflection look. Uh, but we played it, and it was, it was double wide, and it worked. Uh, and people had a lot of fun. Uh, and they stopped complaining that it was too crowded. But they didn't have a lot of complaints beyond that, other than it was a little weird that the thing was copied. Uh, the other thing that they complained about after that was it was too easy. There's four people, we're, we're crushing things. Four players is fun, but like, it's really, there's just nothing to do uh, to that, that can kill you, because you kill things before they even fire. So we thought, well, that's probably because there's four times as many bullets. They're doing four times as much damage, and that's going to be, I'm going to guess, about four times as easy. So I thought, well, what's the naive, obvious solution that we would try first? Let's just divide the amount of damage people do by four, or by three, or by how many players there are, and see how fun it is. And it turned out that it was no longer too easy, and people were engaged again, and kind of getting that shooter twitch going on, and, and uh, it took, both of these were done in like a day, and at GDC. And we had something then that was pretty viable four-player mode. Looked a little bit hacky, a little bit buggy, but we gained a huge amount of information about what was going to be hard, what was going to be easy, and whether it was actually worth doing. And the answer was, yes, it was definitely worth doing. Um, and we ended up making that essentially the heart of our game after that GDC. And it was a real moment for me where I realized that um, prototypes are very powerful and they can change your path, but they can do that in a way that uh, transforms your game uh, multiplicatively for the better. So yeah, the cost where we shoved four players in the game, doubled the screen size, and divided the DPS by the player count. That is a very small amount of work. Uh, the benefits were we gained confidence that four players were worth pursuing and committing to, uh, and uh, I would say if we hadn't done that, the game wouldn't have been worth probably anyone's time. So, dodging bullets and finding gold. Uh, this is basically what Jamestown's about. It's also about how the development process went. Um, two big features that I've talked about at this point were the mid-game stance switching and the four-player mode. One of them we were sure would be awesome and sucked. Uh, one of them we weren't really sure would be awesome and was, and we ended up ditching the stance switching, going for the four-player mode, and making a game that was really fun, in my opinion, and the opinions, I think, of most people who have given it a shot. In both of those cases, the project was saved by the fact that we did the prototype, and if we hadn't, if we had just written design doc at the beginning, and stuck to it, I think we'd have made a crappy game. And I want to caution everyone I ever meet that that can be you, it doesn't matter how good you are. The process by which you come up with your ideas is perhaps more important than your creative power, uh, at least on the surface. So at that point, after learning that lesson, prototyping became compulsion, we prototyped everything. And it just kept reaping these benefits. We kept feeling confident about what would work, uh, before we committed to it, and we kept being right because we took the time to make sure that we took small steps that were reliable and safe. Uh, questions never stop. They really don't. Anyone who's developed a game deep down knows that's true. Um, every feature should be prototyped before you commit to it, uh, especially when you can't recover from it. And uh, as I said before, you just can't do it all up front. And questions keep coming up. So to synopsize what I consider to be the continuous prototyping mindset that, that we developed uh, working on the game is you want to identify your missing information, you want to anticipate the fact that you don't even know what you don't know, 
Uh, ask yourself the right questions. Focus on what you want to know. Focus on what information you want to get out of your prototypes. Um, you want to prototype all your features, especially the unrecoverable ones, even if they happen later in the process. Uh, you don't want to be afraid to shoot things both ways. Uh, it's okay for an important feature. Just do it twice. It's worth your time. Uh, and you want to proactively and compulsively be prototyping uh, as you work. So here, again, to re recap a theory here, this is kind of a, a little si aside, but the more iterations you do, the more information you will acquire. The more information you have, the better your design intuition, that model for the unknowable space will become, and the better decisions you're going to make, which is to say transitively, more iterations, uh, better design decisions, and back to what I said before, to really wrap it all in, low upfront cost, fast iteration time, better design decisions. That's, that's I think, a really important idea. This kind of creativity, um, I think, is a very important aspect of how you want to approach doing prototypes if you're really doing them day to day on your project and you want it to work. So one of the things is to always spend the very least amount possible. Only what you actually have to spend to get your information. You might have an idea for a really fun, cool, powerful prototype that will teach you all kinds of stuff, but you may not actually need to spend that much. And those, the fact that you might spend too much should always be a caution to you. Uh, it is possible to over-prototype, to do too many prototypes, or at least, I should say, to spend too much on prototypes and waste a lot of your resources. So, has anyone here like tried to do prototypes in their day-to-day, -day, like actually given it a shot? Okay, cool. So, um, it's daunting, it's hard. You know, you get in there, you're like, am I wasting my time? Is this, is this even worth it? Uh, I'm just not making my feature. I'm like dicking around with an idea. Um, You've got to be economical about what you do. You, you, it's, uh, you might be dicking around and wasting your time. Always be afraid that that's true, because it could <laughs> totally be true. Um, so you've got to be creative about minimizing your costs. I mean really creative, lateral thinking. You've got to be really smart. Fortunately, most game designers really are creative and smart, so it's a good self-selective group. If you're in this situation, you've probably got what it takes to do this. Um, so, first of all, code is not a requirement. Everyone says that, but it, it's, it's really subtle what that means in day-to-day, -day, in practice. Uh, prototyping shouldn't be code-centric. You shouldn't focus your, your internal vision of what a prototype is around something on a screen that people are playing with a controller or a, a touch screen or a keyboard. That just is a, that's the first step done wrong. You should think about the prototype in terms of what you want to know and think about ways to get that information. It's not always code. Um, code is really slow and expensive, especially if you've ever hired a programmer as a contractor to help with your game. It's really, uh, it is not something to just throw around, around willy-nilly. So you want to cut corners. Uh, here's an example from Jamestown. We call it a gentleman's rules, but uh, it goes by a lot of other names. We had this idea in Jamestown of doing uh, challenge levels. These would be levels where you would go in and uh, play alternate modes with different win conditions. They'd be these short experiences, and it, would, it wouldn't be like you were playing a traditional three-minute with a boss at the end level. It would be this whole other kind of experience. Your goals, your optimization, how you played would be really different, and that would be fun. Uh, but we decided we were going to do this a long time before it actually happened. In fact, we only had, I think, two months before ship at that point in a 21-month development cycle, and we didn't have any challenge levels or challenge code or anything in. And we were like, this is... We can't, we have 20 ideas for what a good challenge level would be. We do not have time to try to even implement more than like four of these. We're just out of time. We don't even have the fifth level finished yet of the main game. We, we can't just explore. Uh, but we still prototyped it. And that was essential. It saved us a huge amount of resources. Uh, we had this idea for score attack. Score attack would be uh, if you get over a certain score, you win. And if you, at the end of the level, when the timer runs out, you have below a certain score, you lose. This sounded pretty likely to be fun. So we thought, well, we could write in some code that told players, you lose or you win, and like put a tally at the top for how they were doing and gave them all this feedback. And then we thought, you know, what we could also do is just tell them at the end of the level, you lost because you didn't get 450,000 points. And then we'd start over. And uh, we'd tell them, remember, 450,000 points, you've got to get that. And then they'd play again. 
and we watched that they were engaged and having fun, and they were strategizing as a team about how to get more points. And you get, you do your your uh, vaunt that'll get you double points. While right before I blow this thing up, and we'll get way more points, and we can get over that number. And they were having fun. We were like, "This is great." And we didn't write any code. We just told them in person, "Get over this number," and that was enough for us to gain the information we needed. Uh, another example would be gun jam. We prototyped it by telling players not to press fire. The idea was, what if you're gun jammed every 10 seconds and then unjammed? And that sucked. Like, that was no <laughs> fun. Uh, and that would have been really hard, based on how we did the controls and the uh, uh, input for our game, to have it unjam and rejam and block. That would have been a fair bit of code, and it would have sucked, especially in person. And I'm really glad that we didn't implement that. And it was super easy to tell. We were like, stop firing. OK. What did you, how did this experience go? Well, it was really not much fun not shooting anything in your shooter. Um, so that was not the strongest one. Maybe we could have made that fun, but we were able to tell it was going to be a hard one at the very least. And then rings was our big triumph. I was really proud of how this turned out. We had this idea of rings that you would fly through. They, they'd come off the top of the screen, and they go to the bottom, and if they went off the bottom without you flying over them, you'd lose. Uh, and so someone on your team had to step onto the ring with their ship before it went off the bottom of the screen. And that was a fairly complex game mode to try to put in. We didn't actually have the idea of game modes at the time. So we'd have to really refactor the whole structure for like win conditions. And we wanted to refactor it around the ones we were actually going to do. So instead of coding it, what we did was our intern, uh, Nate Adams, an extremely talented developer, uh, was like, let's put in sprites of like the shield that used to go around the now defunct shield ship. There's a little ring of energy. Let's just put, I'll just place them in the world, like tiles, as little doodads in the world. And if they don't hit one, we'll tell them to restart. And we watched them play, and it was amazing. They had so much fun when we would play test it. It was a great feature, and uh, it led to more teamwork than I think exists in the game in any other, any other mode. So uh, Rings was a big uh, prototyping success. It would have been really expensive to implement it if it hadn't been fun. We were able to get a lot of certainty with very little work. We just placed rights using existing technology. Um, and I think that these are really good examples of the kind of thing you can do without code that you really can do without code, and it's not weird. It just makes a lot of sense. Always be looking for ways to take the role of arbiter of success or, or arbiter of rules out of your code into person. Can you just do this in person? Um, Another uh, piece of advice would be to use malleable media, the most malleable medium, in fact, that you can. By malleable media, I mean uh, things that are really easy to change, easy to manipulate. Code is not. Uh, code is a really rigid medium, uh, or at least it usually is. Flash makes it fairly malleable. Unity is pretty malleable, but it's nothing compared to pencil and paper uh, or just telling someone something. Uh, so think creatively about your tools. You know, if we could look at physical media. Uh, pen, paper, foil, etc. Those are really quick to modify. When we made Jamestown, we had this idea of a revive cube. It was this little token that would appear out of big enemies. And if anyone on your team had died and you stepped on it, they would all come back at once. That was uh, a really cool feature when you knew how it worked. But we wanted to not have a tutorial for it. We wanted people to just figure it out in game. And they just wouldn't. They just couldn't. They couldn't get it. And everyone was missing out on the experience. So we thought, well, how can we give better feedback? And so we stepped away from the playtest and we kind of pow out in a little huddle and we're like, what should we do? And Mike was like, you know, I think if we just say, when you pick it up, revive uh, all or, you know, uh, respawn everyone or something like that when you hit it, that people will get it. So we were like, okay, let's go for what was it? Respawn, recharge. We had some, some word that we wrote down on a piece of paper. We stood behind the screen and every time that they stepped on the revive and picked it up, we held up the little piece of paper and put it back down. And they didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> but then we kept changing the wording. What we put in, the word was, I think we put revive all, was the words that we put in. And we did that. They're like, oh, and they, and they got it. Uh, and then we did other tests, and we did the same thing, and they got it. And we didn't do any code for that, but we were, we were really confident that that was like the words that we were going to do. And the idea that we would pop it up when we stepped on it was going to convey the information. In fact, when we put that feature in, it just worked. People get it. There's no tutorial. People understand that mechanic within the first game. Uh, so that was a success, and, and it was a good example of how paper can be really good um, medium for things uh, that you don't want to have to actually do art for and integrate into your game. Uh, another really good example, and I, I, I'm sad this is but one bullet point in my talk, 
Uh, digital canvases. Um, it's really intuitive, I think, that code is a really bad way of representing visual information. Uh, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's pretty weak. It turns out that there are tools that are built for manipulating and representing and authoring visual data, like Photoshop and Flash. Uh, you can learn a lot by using those tools to quickly mock up visuals and show people visuals of things and ask them what they think as if it was in game. Uh, like UI, if, if you just, anyone who's done like user uh, experience or user uh, interface design, uh, knows that you can just literally draw a UI and ask someone, how does this work, without letting them even click on it, and learn an enormous amount about what you have done wrong and what you've done right. Uh, and you can try three different ideas really fast. You just move a few things in Photoshop, just dragging them around. Have the, the play tester you know, turn around for a second, drag some things around, uh, and then say, what about now? And it's incredibly quick. It's way faster than code can basically ever be. And you should use this for almost any important functional piece of visual information that you can. It's just better than code. Uh, we regretted not using Flash for the UI of our uh, game after the fact. We didn't use it. We tried to even, in this case, use Photoshop to mock up our UI. But even then, the user flow of clicking the little buttons, which we could have done in seconds in Flash. It's built for building buttons that transition from pages. Uh, if we had just done that, we would have made a much better UI for our game. And, uh, I think that's true of a lot of uh, developers. So think about whether or not, when doing visual information, whether or not you have a better tool than code, uh, and even better than uh, pen and paper for what you're trying to do. Don't do a big setup and take down. You want this to be something you get in and out, gain your information, and walk away. That's the goal. Don't waste your time on anything else. And don't use hammers on problems that aren't nails. Uh, code is a very powerful hammer. It's also uh, not appropriate in way more cases than I think most developers really realize. So think carefully about what the right tool is for gaining that information quickly. So uh, something I actually lied about earlier is that we did uh, prototype phase at the beginning and animating the engine, that's all we did. What we actually did was simultaneously with that, Mike was prototyping the art and the milieu and the setting and the usability of our game in Photoshop while Hal was doing the flash prototype and I was doing the engine code. So uh, we did a bunch of milieu and setting concepts. Mike just concepted up these, these uh, images of our game, uh, as it might be in Fairyland, or you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Shooter, or uh, uh, we had one in, in London. It was like gas lamps in sort of 1800s London or you know, early 1900s. Um, and these were incredibly valuable. Mike sketched them up. I think he did one every two hours or something, uh, and you know, two days of work, and again, this is, this is an important non-recoverable uh, issue, and it was an important synchronization we needed to have as a team. We had, you know, eight different, pretty well fleshed out, pretty mock-ups of what the game could be, uh, visually. And once we had those visuals, we could really talk about the experience and how we felt about those settings in a way that just saying something like early 1900s London, or like Fairyland, or, you know, Tiny World, just doesn't, everyone imagines something different. And I'm not as creative visually as Mike is. Mike's a much better artist than me. Uh, and his artistry helped me imagine and create much more effectively than I would have otherwise. So prototyping those visuals, I think, also had a really important effect. If we had just said, it's going to be this setting, having never drawn it up and really seen it, and then we tried to build the whole game, tried to stretch that idea over five levels, uh, I think that would have been a big mistake. Uh, fortunately, this is something most people do get right by having concept artists. I'm glad that's become a role in game studios now. But it's, it's a form of prototyping. You're gaining information, really important information, uh, as quickly as possible. So we also made the screenshot on the right once we decided on Jamestown as our premise. Uh, that is, you know, Mars, 1600s, uh, the British go in boats off to the New World. And you can see the screenshot. This was just doctored up, so to speak. Like this the engine wasn't even written. <coughs> None of this was in game, but we did a lot of study of what other games did, and we tried out a lot of expectations, like the bullet shape. Uh, the, you know, people call these the pink butts bullets. These didn't make it in the final game. Um, there are other names for them that I'll leave out, but uh, they were much ridiculed, and we, we didn't know exactly why. Also, you can tell with the red background of Mars, and sort of pink colors, pink tones, uh, and the pink bullets. 
it was really hard to tell what you weren't supposed to get hit by uh, when we just had people look at it and say, what's going on here? We wanted them to say, um, you are on Mars, I think, or some alien planet, and your looks like you're either fighting or you're with the British in a spaceship shooting Martians. That was our goal when we made the screenshot. And that's a hard thing to get someone to get with a static screenshot, but it taught us a lot about what needed to be in our game if we wanted people to say that when they saw it in action. Uh, we learned an enormous amount about what we needed to do with our game to achieve that, that, that really important goal of milieu. Do you know where you are? Too many shooters, we, we felt, were about, you know, you're in some factory shooting boxes and spaceships. And I'm gonna go to a different factory, I think, or maybe space station and shoot more. We wanted to actually have a sense of place and purpose. So uh, this was all in Photoshop. We didn't do any part of the game. It was just a lot of good research into pixel art games, etc. Mike also developed a lot of pixel art skills, and we got a unified vision for what kind of game we wanted to make. Pixel art, what is that? It's this. This kind of pixel art, this kind of scale, this kind of artistry. That's what we want the game to be like. Um, that was great. We also threw it in front of a bunch of people and got feedback from them about whether or not they thought it was cool. The answer was yes. Uh, so we went with it. Another thing we did with storyboards for our story sections, uh, very briefly. We didn't do this for all of them, we didn't do this to the end, but early on we drew up uh, you know, lots of different ideas, like a, you know, portraits of a player, of like, a, one of like Sir Walter Raleigh that would like, fade in on top of each other, like someone was drawing the sketches, uh, establishing shots of places for when we would do our story sequences to figure out what kind of storytelling would really be engaging in a shooter. Um, and you could just hold up the pieces of paper and tell them a story or put the text in game but then hold up like kind of an evocative image. Um, and that was pretty useful. That taught us a lot about what wasn't going to work storytelling in our game. Also, uh, making any kind of storytelling taught us about the pacing. That is to say, we wrote like five times or seven times as much text as we could actually get away with. So, you know. Don't write your whole story was a good takeaway for us until you've got um, you know, any sense of how much real estate you've got. Uh, but we chopped it down pretty well and ended up with something pretty good. So, And lastly, of course, as I mentioned, touchstones. They're incredible. If you can do even a whiteboard sketch of what you're talking about during a design discussion, you will sync up way faster and you will get way better ideas. And I can't defend that uh, concretely, but give it a try and see if it's true. Uh, hopefully you already do. So, quick summary I want to do here, and then we can open up for questions. Um, prototyping is an ongoing process. You always have more questions. You always need answers to them. Keep prototyping. It's done at the beginning because it's the perfect tool for that problem. Keep using it. Uh, answer your questions via experimentation. Think about it in terms of information. Always take small steps. Uh, don't write a big old design document and run ahead with it. Uh, you don't commit before you know what you're doing is another good way of looking at that. Uh, if you have a bigger or small question, build a bigger or small prototype. It's okay to spend six months on a prototype. It's okay to write a prototype in an hour and get all the information you need. The least amount of uh, work possible to get the amount of information you need to gain confidence about an important decision. Code is optional. Creativity is required. So uh, how many playtests do we have? How do we get them? Uh, the answer is a lot. Uh, it's a four-player shooter. <laughs> So for like a proper play test, after you know, we, we entered into the four player game being the canonical game, um, we needed four people for play tests. That was really hard to get for a while. But then we realized that uh, there are a lot of schools in the Philly area. There's uh, Temple, Drexel, Penn, and they really are excited about games. And the idea of really going to a game studio and playing a game is a, is a really exciting idea and they have great feedback. They're all gamers, they, they love that. They have the flexibility in their schedule to come in, and that was just amazing. So I'd say, what do you think? 60, 60, 70 percent of our play testers were students, I would say, at least. Um, also online, we had our peers uh, in San Francisco who we knew, because uh, when we first came here to, to do Final Form, we weren't from Philly as developers, we were here when we were younger. Uh, so we had a lot of peers out in San Francisco. We just send them builds periodically. We call them our brain trust. They're actually credited as the brain trust. Uh, and they were developers who had a, a keen insight into design problems. And they gave different, different kinds of feedback. Very useful, just like the, the uh, students were. 
but they gave us a different kind of feedback and that was valuable and they would play the game over and over, new build. There was a sense of continuity between their experience. They could talk about what we changed and whether they liked it better or not. Whereas we bring in new students and they would just say, I like it or I don't. And those were both great questions. Um, and then we eventually got, <coughs> pardon me, uh, we eventually got on Steam and we were able to open it up by giving out beta keys to people uh, later on. Uh, that was actually really useful. We, we, a lot of our features came in at the last minute. I think the, the story came in in the last month. The fifth level was finally finished um, two days before we launched and started, I think, a week and a half before we launched, uh, the third time after we'd scrapped it. Uh, so even at the very end, getting on Steam, throwing it big gave us a lot of information at the end as we threw a lot of things in that needed lots of feedback and revision. Uh, so yeah, I'd say in general, think about your resources. Who do you know? Who do you know that likes games? Who can you call on who you trust and uh, respect, who trusts and respects you? And um, yeah, that's probably enough. In, in terms of how many we had total, it's credited in the game. Uh, I think there's three pages of two columns at like eight point font. I mean, it's, it's over 100. It's over 100, it's probably like 120, 130. And there's probably some people we forgot. Uh, and there's the whole brain trust up front as well. well so, um, I know that when, when we do playtesting, we like to bring in people that have never seen it before every single day. And we sort of then throw them off into the trash bin. So yeah, I, yeah, I wonder yeah. um, <laughs> how reusable have you found your playtesters to be? That's a really good question. And I don't think I have an authoritative answer on that. I will say this, um, fresh eyes, are indispensable. They're, I won't say the most important, but they're the most indispensable. If you don't bring in fresh people constantly, you will run into trouble. It's extremely important that what you make be intuitive for it to be fun, is my belief. You may still need tutorials, but engagement is all about suspension of disbelief in your world as an intuitive, natural place. Uh, the more artificial, the more you have to tell people what they need to do, uh, the harder it is to learn, the less engagement you're going to get. So if you don't have lots of people who have never seen the game coming in frequently, I think your game will, will dramatically suffer. That being said, you know, Nate Adams, who was our intern, started off as a tester, and we just discovered every time we brought him in, he has a really great design mind, uh, every time we brought him in, Great feedback every time. He'd seen the game before, but he was insightful. He just nailed down exactly what we had done wrong in ways that the new testers couldn't articulate. They didn't have the context. This is part of actually why I believe that in larger studios, uh, your, your test should be run by the developer that is making the game. A lot of places like THQ and EA have a test lab where they have like professional test proctors who proctor the test and they film it and then you watch it. Um, the problem is that when you're running the test, the proctors don't know your game, and the testers don't know your game. And you can learn certain information that way, but if you do know your game, if you're an expert on it, you've done lots of tests yourself, you've seen how people react, uh, you have a whole context through which to understand that information, and perhaps to ask important questions at the end after the playtest is over about what you're seeing, because you have that insight. If you're not at the playtest, you can't ask those questions. You aren't there. Those testers went home, and it's over. All you have is what you saw. And I know Val advocates that as extremely important, and it is very important. But um, part of why I like longevity testers is what we call them, testers that come in uh, repeatedly, is they have different insights. They have a context by which to understand your game differently. And it just pulls different information out. I don't like to play favorites with information. The more the merrier, and there's classes of information particularly you can't get out if you don't um, have those longevity testers. As a, a side to that also. Shooters are really hard. Our shooter's really hard. The fifth level on the fifth difficulty, you can't do a fresh tester. You just can't do it. You need someone who's played the game before uh, to test that feature. And I think that's true of a lot of games. You can't test the end of your game without somebody who's played the beginning. Now, if you're a big studio like Valve, maybe you can actually get people in for the whole day or like four days in a row and pay them or something. But um, I think that's a really tall order. So it depends a lot on your game 
how much you're going to need to rely on those longevity tests. When you're doing these testings, especially in small, uh, small groups and small scale, um, how, do you, how do you glean the information from your testers and make sure that that, that information sticks? Uh, it, it sticks with the designer uh, or, or the developer. Right, so. yeah, that's, those are great questions. Uh, yes, so the questions are, how do we go about uh, acquiring that information from our testers? And then the second part is, how do we record so that we can go back to it later? Uh, we tried a lot of things uh, with the recording, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But in terms of how we glean it, um, I actually went to a talk by Michael Ambinder, uh, GDC, who is Valve's playtest guru. He's a, a, like a psychologist, and he has access to skin conductivity measurements and you know, encephalograms and all kinds of crazy metrics. And he was talking at his talk about um, how they gather information. We learned a lot from that. We tried a lot of their ideas out that we could afford. We couldn't do all the fancy rigs and everything. But he talked about um, the idea of doing surveys at the end. Um, he talked about the difference between people ranking things and people rating things. If you give people a list of 10 things, you say rate these from 1 to 5 each. Or you say rank these things in order of awesomeness, you get very different information, sometimes extremely contradictory information. So surveys reveal interesting information. But he always said, he kept harping on this, and I think he's totally right, the most valuable thing is watching your players and interpreting from them uh, their experience and their psychology. I, I strongly advocate when you do a test, you don't, ask, you don't tell them anything except uh, that you're not going to tell them anything. You should encourage them. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the pitch. Here's what we say at the beginning of our test for Jamestown. We say, so thanks for coming in and testing. Um, we do things a little bit interestingly. It's a little counterintuitive. When you test our game, you're going to sit there, and we're going to stand behind you and just watch. And you're going to be playing the game. And we want you to go into what we call faucet mode, uh, where you go, you have faucet mouth. You just talk. Like, like you don't have the ability to control what you're saying. Everything you think, just say it. Uh, you can ask questions, you can say what you're thinking, you can you know, rag on the game, whatever you want. We will not answer any questions, we will not respond to you, but just, just go. What we want is a window into your mind so that we can essentially have telepathy. And so we're counting on you to just talk about whatever it is. Don't worry about saying stupid things. People say stupid things all the time. People think stupid things. We're not gonna judge you. If you're frustrated at the game, that's fine. It's probably our fault. Uh, for making a crappy game, and if you tell us what you're thinking, we'll make it better. So then we go in, and we sit in front of the machine, we say something like, okay, you just bought this game off of Steam, you've never heard of it, amazingly. Uh, it just, you know, someone gifted it to you. Now play. And we just watch the whole thing. And um, they'll run into problems, usually really big problems, like it doesn't run, or I can't figure out what, I, what controller I'm supposed to, is it mouse, is it keyboard? Etc. But we don't answer those questions. Uh, we let them uh, struggle. It's important that we let them struggle because we want to know how bad the problem is. If we let them struggle for a minute and they fix it, it's a one minute inconvenience problem. If we let them struggle for 10 minutes and they don't get it, it's a really big problem and they're just not going to get it. At a certain point, we can identify that they have given up. They'll say something like, at this point, I will close the game. And we'll let them go for another minute or so. And then we'll finally intervene and say, okay, this is actually a non-progression problem and we'll fix it for them. But we let them really flounder, and it's uncomfortable, and it's awkward. That's why you have to say that thing up front to establish that relationship. Uh, that that's what you're going to do. Um, but when they're in there, and they're playing, and they're making uh, your game look really bad, uh, that's great information. You learn not, you, the, the, the severity of problems is super valuable. That's why I think that's the biggest reason not to tell them anything, is that everything that happens after that, what they try, uh, what they expect, even, it, it to be, is revealed by their actions. If they start pressing keys, pay attention to what keys are they pressing. And if they're doing a good job, they'll say something like, I think maybe I should press escape here. I think that's what'll work. It'll probably do this. And you start to understand what they expect. And you want to watch that whole game tree go down. You want to watch them go through all their ideas, one after another, from the most intuitive to the next most intuitive to the next most intuitive. Uh, it gives you a palette of choices. If the first thing they try is totally infeasible, maybe the second most obvious thing isn't, or the third most obvious thing. You get a really good model for why they're confused and what their expectations are. Um, so we always do that. And then usually we start opening things up after we feel like they have grown uh, comfortable in the game. 
Uh, and they might, for instance, go to a forum and ask people stuff, or go to GameFAQs, or, or email us, or whatever. When we get to that stage, we start to dole a little information out. Because we want to get as much information as possible. The, the, the sanctity of not polluting their mind is wonderful. But at some point, if they haven't ever pressed the, the special fire button, you're not going to get any information about the special fire button except that they didn't press it. If you have a crazy idea, or you're like, you know what would be awesome is if they were to rank the different ships right now. Because I have no idea what they think, and I'm really curious which ones they think are fun. You give everybody a piece of paper, all four players, and you write down really quick all the different ships. And then they all rank them. And maybe that won't tell you anything useful. Or maybe it'll tell you something really valuable. And you maybe get a good conversation going with them after the play test, where you're like, okay, well you ranked it this way, you ranked it this way. Fight. And, uh, and I think those are super valuable. There's a hundred ways to get information out of people. What you want to do is just think creatively about how you can get it all out. And, you're gonna, and that's, that's the motivation for not saying something at the beginning, and that's the motivation for saying something at the end. You want it all. And you'll get an intuition. I mean, you'll screw up your first, I don't know, eight, seven, seven eight play tests, probably we did, uh, and do it wrong and regret that you just totally, you just didn't get what you needed to know. You, you could have if you were better at what you were doing, but you screwed it up. But uh, you get better at it. You get a feel for it. You start to know, don't do that. You start to get cues with the other tester, test proctors. We are kind of like, you know, you'll kind of, let's say the testers here, you'll kind of do like a, like, <laughs> you don't want them to see, but you want to like communicate that you're really excited about this, or, um, or you might be kind of like, look over and be like, like, we cut this one off, or, or things like that, or. We also call meetings. We call meetings. We'll like, you know, after this round, we're probably going to do a little meeting, uh, we'll be right back don't play while we're gone and we're in the other room, you gotta get a good collaborative process going. That could be just, this is the guy who talks. If you want to say something, write him a letter, give it to him, write down any questions you have right then, and ultimately use your judgment. If, if he's doing something and you've got to know why he just pressed that button, it makes no sense with your model, it's totally counterintuitive. Sometimes you just gotta use your judgment and say, hold on one second, why did you press that? I know it's really important that you'd give me this information right now. And I would be willing to jeopardize this playtest by possibly giving information, breaking the flow. I'm willing to, to stand in front of my coworkers and say, I did it because it was really important. Then you just have to use that judgment. But anyway, that's like that part of it. In terms of notating it for future generations and future um, uh, viewing, you know, at first, what we always do, first of all, is we get paper. Everyone has a notepad, it's a rule, uh, and a piece of paper. And we write down any observation that we have, uh, anything we notice a quote, something that we're curious why he didn't do something. If it's something we want to really talk about, possibly at this, if we want to talk about it at all, we usually put a star next to it. That means there's going to be a bunch of just noise in here. I'm going to preemptively say, I want to talk about this later. Star it, because it becomes a sea of noise. Reading all that text takes a long time. It's like a small book when you're done. Um, and then I usually, I don't know if Mikey does something like this, but uh, I always do two stars if it's something I want to talk about like at the end of this next round. Uh, as a way of saying, I really have got to do this while the playtester's here. Or things like going through playtest notes, or doing a postmortem, things like that. Everyone has information to add. Uh, someone's talking, someone else needs to start taking notes because that person's talking. It's organic, it's fluid. So we usually, usually do the Google Doc, and we write down the big takeaways from it, uh, usually in the in form of prototypes we like to run. Uh, because that information is really transient. You're writing it all down takes a long time. We used to do that. We would write every dang note down. Or we'd try to initially take the notes in the Google Docs. And what we found is that information becomes crap like a week later. And you'd spend a huge amount of time writing it all down. It's a disincentive to run a play test because you know there's this huge process you have to go through to like get it finished. Uh, and so we started being like, what are the start items? If you didn't start, it's probably not a big enough deal right now. The start stuff's probably more important. And if it's a big enough problem, you're going to see it in the next play test. You can write it down again. And eventually, you're going to start the thing. And if it isn't there in the next play test because you remove that feature, you don't need to write it all down. It's gone. The feature's gone. And if you don't remember it, it probably wasn't a huge takeaway. Or maybe you should have talked about it more at the meeting so it would stick. Uh, and if it's really subtle and you're like, oh man, I know we had this in the last play test. We didn't. We had this in like three play tests and we never act on it. Take to look, be, be extra proactive, really write it down, and say, okay, we keep forgetting this. This is one of those slippery, 
lessons that just keeps getting out of our hands. We're going to write this down on a big piece of paper and put it on the, on the wall so that we see it every day because it's important and we keep forgetting it. But those don't happen very often. But in general, I'd say write less down, write, write more down at the test, do less reading afterward, do a lot of talking, and get on to the next play test. You'll get all that information again if it was important. So I'll tell the story, it'll be fun. Uh, I was living in Berkeley back in 2008 or 2007 uh, with a friend of mine who was a guitarist. He was actually uh, Joe Satriani's like, uh, you know, student's student or something. So he had like a really Joe Satriani awesome guitar style. He was fantastically talented, he was like six bands. Everyone wanted to play with him. Well, he was from Chile, though, but his mother was Chilean and his, uh, his father was American, and so, or vice versa. And so he came to the U.S. and was totally like native U.S. guy. But he was from Chile, he had lots of people from Chile, musicians. In particular, his friend uh, Francisco Cerda uh, was a pianist, an incredible composer, pianist, music student, who was coming up for a, a concert he was going to perform, a little you know, piano tour and he needed a place to stay. So Francisco came and lived on our couch for like a week. Uh, I was sick that week, and so I was sitting in the living room where he was asleep, basically, uh, programming on my own stuff and having a good time and you know, forgetting the fact that I you know, was sneezing every six seconds. And Francisco got up and you know, said hi, went over to the piano that I owned, uh, and started playing. And I kept programming. And after like an hour, I realized he was still playing. And it was really beautiful, evocative music. Uh, and I asked him, what, what is that? Like, I've never heard that. Turning was just improvising. He was just kind of, you know, just throwing down whatever to get warmed up for practice. Um, I like, this guy's a really good composer. So I asked him, like, do you ever do any stuff for games? Thinking maybe he liked video games. Like, actually, he's like, I used to program video games in QBasic. I wrote my own shooter game, like a top-down shooter. Uh, because I always wanted to do a soundtrack for a top-down shooter game. Uh, and I was like, well, we should stay in touch. So at that time, I was thinking, I'd love to do a top-down shooter game with great music in it. That's true. There are documents about how I want to do like a, a music-centric shooter game. So uh, we kept in touch. And two years after that, we were making our game. I was like, we need music. Music is going to make this whole game. And so I wrote to Francisco. I said, you still down? He's like, of course. And then we did a little, you know, we tried a bunch of composers out, and he was just, oh my god, that guy's amazing. If anyone ever needs any music done, he's super talented. And to the point that when we submitted to the Independent Games Festival, we got an honorable mention for audio, uh, specifically because his music is like the best music that year. The sound effects weren't as strong at the time, uh, which is why I think we got an honorable mention, but the music was incredible. It is incredible. Uh, I was playing some of it earlier. Um, Shortly after getting that honorable mention, Steam contacted us to say, we heard about your game through the IGF. It looks really cool. Your, your premise is neat. Have you thought about distributing it on Steam for a PC release? And we were like, we have. We just hadn't told you because we're terrified of you. Um, <laughs> but we love you. Uh, please, please, let this be true. And, and they, we said, OK. Let us know if you need any more information you know, if, when you want to ship. That was like it. We were just, we were like, do we need to like send you a bill? And they're like, sure, whenever you're ready. Just let us know when you, you know, which, what price point you're thinking now. We're like, really? <laughs> and, and then we went out on Steam and it was great. Uh, they're like the best people to work with in the world. I, I, I've determined that there's no rule for getting on. But uh, what essentially, to answer your question in, in a shorter way, we didn't submit it to them, but word got out about, we started in January on the, on the real game, that is the post-prototype phase, so five months up front plus, and that was uh, up until January 10th, we started on the in-game, and then we submitted on October 10th, 15th, something like that. Mid-October, and they contacted us after the results were announced in January within, uh, like day. two days or a day of the IGF on our launch. Um, they, I would say it was like a year in when they contacted us based on stuff that was about nine months in. Submit what you would want them to stumble into and be amazed by. Uh, and this really, I think why we got on, uh, on Steam is a combination of having an amazing composer, something never to be overlooked, uh, 
And the fact that we had a good premise, which we got because we prototyped out our concepts and we thought very carefully about the marketability of our aesthetic, of our uh, premise. We knew that if people got excited by the idea of 1600s British Colonial Mars top-down shooter with retro graphics, that was weird and made people say, huh? And that was powerful. And Steam, I think, identified that that, that was marketable, that could sell. Um, I think good decisions up front paid off downstream. Um, I went to a panel he did about how to market games and how to succeed as an indie or as a game studio, actually. And I asked him, like, you know, I just finished an iOS game at that time called Booty Blocks that didn't do extremely well, but it was, you know, it paid for itself. And I said, you know, how do you get noticed? How do you get people to pay any attention to your game? And he said, make a really good game. Then people will come to you. And I, at the time, was like, that's a pretty glib response. That's uh, easily said for a dude who spent, you know, three hundred thousand dollars in three years. And the other panelists said the same thing. They're like, oh, that's a pretty you know, glib, off the cuff remark. It turned out to be totally true. We, our goal with our game, which we settled on after that GDC, where I made the party mode, we were like, what do we want to do here? We we can make a game that makes money. We can make a game that. Uh, is fun and so on. We talked about like what, what do we really want this game to be? What's what's the number one goal? And it was that we'd be proud of it and that it'd be fun. That we could look anyone in the eye and confidently, as I did in this talk, say, it's really fun. And that's it.